why don't we why don't we pray again for God to bless our time and tours. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is faithful. You are a God who is good. You are a God who loves us. You are a God who reveals himself to us. And Lord, as we look into your word, as we see your truth, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. We pray that you would convict us. We pray that you would guide us. So Lord, help us to not be distracted by what we're going to eat for lunch, by what we need to do later today for the, for the coming school week, whatever it may be. Lord, help us not to be distracted with each other uh, even now, but Lord, help us to really be focused upon you, to be focused on Christ, and to really seek to worship you in these very moments. And so Lord, may you be pleased with our worship and pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Darren, Kyle, Kirk, Damon, Eric, and Dan. Now, these are not just random names, but they're probably names that they don't really mean a whole lot to you. You hear these names, and maybe these are some of your names. Uh, actually, yeah, some of, some of your names. Um, maybe you know people by these names, and maybe you can picture a Darren who is in this room. Maybe you can picture a Damon or an Eric or a Kirk that you know. And you have some images of these people in your minds, but really these names don't really mean a whole lot to you. But I can tell you that these names for me, they mean a whole lot to me because all of these names that I mentioned, these are real people that have been in my life. When I think of Darren, I think of basically the guy who served as my youth pastor. And this was one of the first guys that I met as I began going to church. I met this guy, Darren, and he took me and a bunch of my friends in small group, and we began to learn and grow in the Lord. We began to pray for each other and encourage each other. And this is a man that I remember very fondly. I think of a guy named Kyle, Kyle Shimazaki. I still remember it. He's the one that led me to the Lord. He shared scripture with me. He walked with me and a friend, sat us down, told us about Jesus, and we placed our faith in Christ at that family uh, retreat at my old church. I think of a man named Kirk. This man, Kirk, was one of the greatest servants that I've ever seen. He was always behind the scenes, never complained about anything, but was always willing and ready to be the first one to serve in whatever need that the church and the youth group needed. Damon, I think of a man named Damon, and this guy, he was one of the counselors. He was one of the leaders in my youth group, and I remember how he cared for me in so many different ways. I actually join him um, as he was a head coach. I joined him as an assistant coach for basketball, and I learned a lot from him in this way. He took me out to eat, I know, a few times. And this this was a guy who really cared for me. Uh, the names Eric and Dan, these guys were, were the co-best men at my wedding, at Beatrice and I, at our wedding. And these guys, they took me under their wing. They mentored me. They loved me. They cared for me. They shepherded me. And these all are very significant people in my life. They don't mean much to you, but they mean a whole world to me. I'm here right now, this morning, able to bring the Word of God to you because of what these leaders have done in my life, how they shaped me, how they grew me, how they led me to Christ. And I'm sure that you can think of, hopefully, some leaders in your life that have done similar for you. We're taking a break, as you can see. Uh, we're taking a break from the book of Acts, and we're looking at this idea uh, of stewardship. When you think about stewardship, this is really utilizing well the things that in our the things that are in our lives. It is taking the opportunity of what God has given to us and using it to bless others, using it in a way that may be impactful. Today, what we're going to look at specifically is the aspects of leadership. And really, the author of Hebrews gives us three very important, three very key imperatives that will guide our study this morning, and it's in our title for this sermon. It is Remember, Obey, and Pray. Remember, Obey, and Pray for your leaders. Now, a little bit of context. Since we haven't been in Hebrews, this will help us to orient where we're at in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 12, as you look at how it concludes, it says in verse 28, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. 
by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. The author of Hebrews, as he writes, he's building an argument. He's, he's writing to say that Jesus is supreme, that Jesus is the glorious, the most glorious person that you could ever know. Jesus is superior than anything that you could ever think of. And as he builds this argument to show who Christ is, he says, you guys have received Christ. You received this kingdom, this unshakable faith. And because of that, show gratitude. Show thankfulness. And really what he says is because of what Christ has done, because Jesus is so superior, because he is so majestic, worship him. Offer acceptable service with reverence and awe. And just to remind you, who is God? Again, God is the one who is a consuming fire. God is the one who has the power to judge us. God is the one who shows his wrath for those who do not believe. And this is the reminder and the context. In light of worship and service to God, then comes chapter 13. And the author of Hebrews then gives us practical advice, practical suggestions, really on how we can worship God and how we can conduct ourselves in a manner that is pleasing to Him. Some of these uh, words of advice are, are general. Some of them are general. They're, they're covering different things like hospitality, uh, talking about marriage in, in verse 4. And some are specific, as we're going to look at today, specific to the leaders that God has placed in your life. So the first point that we're going to see this morning, the first imperative that we need to have towards leaders is remember your leaders. Remember your leaders. Look at verses 7 to 8. We'll read verse 7 first. It says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. What the author of Hebrews is saying here, as he gives this imperative first to remember, he is saying not just a one-time deal. You remember the one time that a leader has done something for you, and then you could forget about it. But what the author of Hebrews is saying, remember and to continue to remember. Keep on thinking about the leaders in your life that God has placed in your life, and specifically those who have led you in the Word of God. Teachers who have taught you about Jesus, about the stories in the Old Testament, about stories in the New Testament. Remember these people of faith. Think about their lives. Think about their testimony. Consider their instruction. Consider their life. And imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. And if you look back in Hebrews chapter 11, it's no mistake that the author of Hebrews gives us a number of individuals that we are to imitate. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 1, and we'll look at just a few of these. It says, Now faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. The author of Hebrews is not looking at current people, but he's looking in the past and saying, hey, look at these old people of faith. Look at these faithful men and women of God who have gone forth from us. But what can we learn from them? What can we see about the faith that they exhibited? Verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. How many of you were at the creation? None of you. None of us were able to see it. None of us were able to document it. There's no videos, real life videos, from however long ago it was. There's nothing to show us exactly what happened and how God created it. We have it in God's Word, and we need to take it by faith that as God says, let there be light, that there was light. We need to take it in faith that as God has spoken through His Word in Genesis 1 and 2, that that is exactly how it happened. We need to take that in faith even today because no one was there to observe this creation that has happened. Verse 4, it says, By faith, we look at a specific individual, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he attained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Cable, or Ain, sorry, Abel and Cain, they were brothers. 
They were brothers and they both brought sacrifices to God. One brought a sacrifice that was pleasing to God and one brought a sacrifice that wasn't pleasing to God. And basically they took that as a step of faith in offering the best that they had and Abel did it rightly before God. We don't know exactly why Abel's offering was more acceptable than Cain's, but perhaps it was in the heart attitude that Abel brought his sacrifice. And by faith, Abel was in a new creation. He's There's not too many people in the world at this time. They didn't know too much about sacrifice and offering. But Abel, in faith, believing in God, brought the proper sacrifice and worship to God. And he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. Abel acted in faith. You look at the scripture as it continues in Hebrews. It says, by faith and Hebrews 11, verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Enoch is a very special person in the Bible because Enoch is one of the few, along with Elijah, who did not taste death in this life. What God saw in Enoch was a man who was walking in faith faith and walking in love and worship with God. Enoch walked in a way that was unlike anyone in the land and on the earth. And because Enoch walked in a way that was pleasing to God, God looked at Enoch and said, I'm going to spare your life, Enoch. I'm going to spare you from death. And God took Enoch up. Enoch was there existing and then God took him into his own presence. And because of faith, we praise Enoch as someone who we should imitate and we should follow because he was someone who stood against evil in many ways and he showed himself as someone different in humanity. Verse 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is is a rewarder of those who seek him. Verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Think about Noah, for instance, and you see what the author of Hebrews says. He is warned by God about things not yet seen. God comes to Noah and says, Build an ark. And we are sitting here and we know, okay, we know what an ark is. It's basically a big boat. But at the time, Noah, God comes to him and says, hey, build an ark. And Noah's standing there thinking, what's an ark? I don't know what an ark is. I've never seen an ark before. I don't know what you're talking about. And then God gives him specific instructions, detail by detail, very exact. And Noah says, okay, I'll build the ark, God, because you said it. And I'm going to go in faith that this needs to be done. And I'm going to build this ark, something that has never been seen before. God, you talk about rain that is going to come. We've never seen this type of rain. We've never seen this type of flooding that has ever resulted. But God, if you're saying something bad is going to come that's going to destroy the earth, and if we're not on this ark that we're going to perish and die, I'm going to believe in you and I'm going to have faith. Noah is heralded as someone who has faith. And you look at the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, and really this is a hall of faith. We see men and women of God who had complete faith and trust in God. And because they were faithful, God honored them. And God was pleased by their lives. And we are to look at people like these in Hebrews chapter 11 and other people in Scripture We look at the conduct of their lives. We look at the outcome, their way of life, how they have lived, and we are to imitate their faith. We are to imitate their godliness. And as you look at the scripture back in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, the implication here is that these people are no longer with us. These specific leaders in verses 7, in verse 7 and 8, that the author of Hebrews is thinking about is these are leaders who have passed away and who have died. And that's why we can consider the totality of their lives and we can imitate their faith. Uh, I've put on here uh, some of the people that I really admire uh, in history, in the Bible. 
Um, does any, can anyone identify anyone here on the screen? Uh, yes. Oh, it's pretty good. John Calvin to the top right. John Calvin was a reformer uh, in Geneva. And when you think about the things of doctrines of grace, uh, tulip, if you will, Calvinism, uh, it comes from a lot of his teachings. Uh, you look at the top left, any guesses at who that is? Mo, yes. Or go ahead, give me a different one. Bottom left is Martin Luther. Martin Luther, we know him as someone who was faithful. He was one man that was battling against the Roman Catholic Church and saying, what you guys are doing is displeasing to God. And we are saved by faith alone. And Martin Luther stood against a whole group of people who wanted to kill him. And they imprisoned him. They, they tried to get him to repent or to recant his sayings. And he stood as a man who was faithful. The top left, you look at a man, Moses. Moses was someone who was faithful to God. He had a people who grumbled constantly, day after day after day. But he held on to God's word and led the people as best as he could in faith. Uh, you look in the middle, bottom middle, uh, one of my uh, favorite authors, uh, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Jonathan Edwards is known as one of the, the greatest American preachers to have ever lived through history. Uh, and, you know, he writes, uh, he wrote the famous sermon, Sin Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, he's written other books, uh, The End for Which God uh, Has Created the World, uh, Religious Affections, uh, things like that. Uh, and he is uh, kind of hard to read if you've never read him before, but he is someone who uh, is very uh, worth your reading. Uh, how many of you know John Piper? John Piper. Uh, maybe a half or a quarter of you. John Piper, I believe he would say that Jonathan Edwards was one of his heroes. And one of the people that was most influential and has been most in influential in John Piper's life, in John Piper's theology, is Jonathan Edwards. Uh, you look at the right. Um, this was, the bottom right is, is what we picture of someone's uh, rendition of, of the Apostle Paul. And you see Paul there, he's working hard. Perhaps he's uh, studying the scriptures. Perhaps he's penning some of the New Testament books that we see before us today. That's a man worth imitating. We look at Paul, and this was one of the greatest, if not the greatest missionaries that we have ever seen in humanity. All of these men here have something in common. They're all dead. You look at all of them. They're all dead. They're not here anymore, but they were all faithful men of God, that we should remember in many ways. But you think about these men too, as they have passed away, you may even think of people in your own life, people who have been instrumental in your own faith that are no longer with us or with you right now. Perhaps you have a grandparent in your life, and this grandparent, this was the one person that was bringing you to church that was encouraging you to read the Bible, that was encouraging you to pray, that was praying with you. And that grandparent, because of old age, because of disease, because of something, that grandparent has passed away. Perhaps you have a parent in your life that was doing that same thing. Uh, they were praying for you. They led you to faith. They led you to Christ when you were younger. And something happened. God took them from, from, from cancer or from an accident or something else. And you think about people like that, and it makes you sad. And it should make you sad when people that we love, when people that walk with us, when they're no longer with us, it just makes us sad. It, it makes us feel discouraged because these people who were so impactful for us are no longer here. And if we stopped at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, it would be somewhat of a discouraging verse as we just remember the days of old, as we remember these people that led us in the ways of God but they're no longer with us. And we can come away just feeling sad and not wanting to do anything. But the author of Hebrews, knowing exactly that, points us to the greatest leader that we could ever know. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The author of Hebrews points us to the great leader, Jesus Christ. You look at who Jesus is. He is the same yesterday and today. Jesus does not change. And what is emphasized and highlighted above all is that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
and forever and for all time. The emphasis is on the eternality of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not a created being, but Jesus, like God who just existed eternally, so Jesus also existed eternally. Jesus rules now and He is alive. He is the eternal priesthood as Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6 says. If you flip to the beginning of Hebrews chapter 1, we get a grand description of who Jesus is. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. It says, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, that's Jesus, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. Verse 3, and He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become, verse 4, as much better than the angels as He has inherited a more excellent name than they. How's that for description of Jesus, the greatest leader that we could ever know. God was speaking through the fathers. He was speaking through the prophets in many portions and in many ways. But now, today, how does God speak? God speaks through Jesus Christ, His Son. And who is Jesus? Jesus is the heir of all things. Jesus is the creator of the world. He is this bright radiance and glory of God the Father. He is the exact representation. If you want to know what God looks like, then look at the life of Christ and you get this exact picture of the beauty and the grace and the love of God. Jesus upholds the the world um, and all things by the word of His power. As Jesus speaks, things happen and He upholds it all. And you look at what else Jesus does. Jesus sits down at the right hand of the Father because He was done with His work. It was complete sins, the sins of mankind had been paid for and Jesus was is now at the right hand of God interceding on behalf of us. Jesus is greater than any angel that we could ever know. Jesus is the greatest man. He is the God man. And we are to worship and praise Him. Though leaders will come and go in our lives, perhaps they'll move away, perhaps they will die. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus is the greatest leader ever that we are to imitate. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perspector of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The author of Hebrews here in this instance, Hebrews chapter 12, encourages us to fix our eyes, to lock our attentions, to lock all of our affections upon Jesus, who is the perfect, author of our faith. And why was Jesus perfect in this way? Because for the joy that was set before Him, Jesus went to the cross to die for you and His work was finished. That's why He sat down at the throne of God to be worshipped and to be praised. We are to imitate the faith of Jesus. We are to imitate the faith of the leaders that God has placed in our lives as they imitate Christ Himself. Let me ask you this morning, are you looking to Jesus? Are you looking to Jesus? Are you imitating Jesus Christ in your life today? What would we see if we were able to trace out your life? We were able to trace out your life and compare it and contrast it with the life of Christ. What would we see? Would we see that you are veering far off from this picture of Christ? Or would we see that from last year into this year, your shape, your image is growing a little bit closer, a little bit tighter, a little bit more representing and mirroring the life of Christ Himself. What would we see this morning if we compared your life 
to the great leader, to our great Savior, Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews tells us, remember your leaders, and most of all, remember the greatest leader, Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The author of Hebrews gives us a second imperative. It's not just remember your leaders, but obey your leaders. Obey your leaders. Look at verse 17. Verse 17. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. The word here, obey, has this same continuous action that is involved. It's not just a one-time obedience that, that you, I say, read your Bible, you read it once and you think you're done. But this is a continuous, you need to put your trust, you need to keep on trusting, you need to keep on obeying your leaders and to submit to them. Really, you follow them. As they tell you to do something, the author of Hebrews is saying, as your leaders speak, submit to them, acknowledge them, follow them. You know, many can say that, yeah, I trust you. I trust you. I believe in you. But not many will go that extra step in saying, I trust you and actually following through and doing the things that you're saying. You know, how many times have you told someone and said, yeah, I believe in you, but then you just totally went the other way and didn't care about what they were doing? We need to do both. We need to just obey. We need to uh, not only obey and listen, but we need to follow through and to submit and actually do and show action. Why do we need to obey and to submit to our leaders? Because, as the author of Hebrews tells us, is because they look after and they care about, they watch over your souls and they will give an account. This is what leaders do. The picture here is of a shepherd. Let me, let me try and illustrate this for you in, in nature as we see this. Uh, can we get the next slide? I think it's the next slide. Do you guys know what this is? Yes, I heard it there. It is a meerkat. Uh, you can ask later after service. Uh, Beatrice does a great meerkat impression. <laughs> but basically, you look at a meerkat, they're just they're like this. You see that one on the bottom left? He's kind of like on top of a rock. You see these other two there? They're on top of a higher point. And you see that one? He's just like peering out, just like looking and analyzing. And you see meerkats as they're there. They're waiting and they're looking. And you have one single meerkat that's there. That's not just a loner meerkat. But that meerkat has a job. That meerkat has a job to protect the rest of the family. And he's sitting there perched up on that rock, just inspecting, just analyzing, just observing. And if he sees anything that is troubling, if he sees anything that is out of the ordinary, like a lion starting to prowl through their midst, his job is to sound the alert and to tell all the other meerkats, all the rest of his family, that trouble is coming. That meerkat is essential to the group because as he is leading and watching that group, he is responsible for the rest of the group. If he does not speak up, then trouble is coming and basically the whole family is going to be wiped out. The meerkat is watching over the livelihood. That soldier meerkat is watching over the livelihood of the rest of the group and leaders in your lives are doing the same for you. They are sitting there at attention, watching out for your livelihood. They are watching out for your souls as they are seeing danger come into the picture. Their job and their responsibility is to say, wake up, watch out, Satan is coming, temptation is here. And they are to sound the alarm. Leaders, you need to obey them because they care about your soul. They are trying to keep you from hell. They are trying to point you to Jesus Christ. They are watching out for danger for you and they are helping to alert you of danger. I've seen counselors. I've seen teachers. I've seen leaders pour themselves out for you guys, every single one of you guys in this room. I've seen counselors cry over you guys because they're seeing you guys do things that are not pleasing to God. and They're seeing you perhaps not in church anymore, too busy for God. I've seen them just be heartbroken over that fact because it is heartbreaking. 
And it's hard for us as leaders as we look at you guys and as we see you and you're not quite understanding the things of God, it hurts us because we want you to worship God. We want you to see God in His fullest sense. You look at your leaders and you think about your current leaders as the author of Hebrews has turned to talk about current leaders in your life in chapter in 13, verse 17. He's talking about these present leaders. Your leaders, your counselors, your teachers, they love you guys. They really love you guys. I don't know if you guys believe that or not, but it's true. This is why people serve week and week after week after week because they love you guys, because they care for you, because they want to see you grow, because they are watching after your soul. And that is a serious responsibility. So then, the author of Hebrews gives us something else, and our responsibility here, he says, why do we need to obey and submit? And he says at the end of verse 17, let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Why obey and submit so that you don't cause grief in the life of a leader, so you don't cause trouble and pain in the life of a leader, but instead you can be a source of great joy. You know, think about the beginning of the year as we began youth service. You can maybe think about it and you can imagine it a little bit, and some of it still goes on now. It was very rowdy. You guys are coming in here. You guys weren't coming in with a purpose of worship. People are talking. People, you're leaving trash everywhere. You're not listening very well. And this is not all of you, but this was some of you. And there is a lot of you know, disturbance and a lot of distraction that was going on. And I, you know, I meet with the youth service officers basically once a month. And in many of those meetings, we're sitting there and we're thinking, what do we do about all these distractions? How can we get these students to really worship God? And we're sitting there and it's difficult for us. And we're sitting there and we're groaning and we're sighing because we're thinking, why don't these students just get it? Why don't they want to worship God? Why don't they see God's majesty and sit here and listen and worship because God is so good? And we brainstormed and we prayed and we prayed. And eventually I think it got a little bit better and we go through our ups and downs. Um, But this is what we see. When you are not listening and obeying your leaders, your counselors, your teachers, then you cause agony and you cause grief. And you are not a source of joy, but you are a source of hindrance for all those in our midst. And this is unprofitable for them and this is unprofitable for you. We're not here to be your babysitters. We're not here for that. If we wanted to babysit you guys, we would just hire someone to do it. But we're here to care for your souls. This is our responsibility. Do you guys know that heaven and hell are real? That your souls are hanging in the balance right now? What we do right now, this is serious. This is not just a made up and pretend story, but this is impactful for your eternity in life. Satan, the devil, is real. And he is prowling around right now like a lion ready to pounce upon you. Do you know Satan has been existing for thousands of years and he has studied mankind for those thousands of years and he knows exactly every single one of our weak points. Don't think that you're strong enough to withstand Satan because you can't. Because he knows us better than we even know ourselves and he knows how to draw us down. And that's why we need to listen. Listen and obey and submit to your leaders because they are watching out for your soul. Because they are trying to care for you as God has called them to, as God has directed to them. Listen and obey. Be a source of joy. Remember your leaders. Obey your leaders. And thirdly, pray for your leaders. Pray for your leaders. And this is in reference also to current leaders. Look at verses 18 and 19. It says, Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you all the more to do this, so that I may be restored to you the sooner. 
the author of Hebrews again, he's saying not just, hey, you pray one time for a leader and you're done for life. But he's saying, keep on praying for the leaders. They need your prayers. Why? Because life is hard. If you think life is easy, then you need to wake up because life is difficult. I've been talking to some of you, and I, you know, especially some of you who have trenches in high school. I say, hey, how's high school? And many of you have said, oh my gosh, it's so hard. It's so busy. Uh, and let me tell you, life continues just to get harder. And it continues to get busier. Just once you're done with school, it doesn't mean, oh, no more school, but it means more responsibility. It means more trials, more temptation. Things are going to get busier. And that's why the author of Hebrews is saying, as challenges come, we have a desire to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. That's why you need to pray for us so that we can remain in good conscience to lead you. Keep on praying. Don't let it just be a one-time deal, but keep on praying continually in your life for the leaders that God has placed there. And think about the importance of this prayer because the, the author of Hebrews, the desire for the leaders is to conduct themselves honorably, commendably, excellently before his peers and before the world. And just think about that for a moment. What happens if a leader falls? And what happens if a leader fails? Let's say you're at a big church and you get wind that the pastor has, or any leader, has committed adultery. They cheated on their wife. How many of you are still going to follow that leader? I hope none of you would, because that is something that is offensive. That is something that is displeasing God. They have failed in their leadership in that way, and they have lost your respect. They have lost their credibility to lead. How many of you, if you had a leader that you found out they were stealing all this money from the offering plate, from the safe at church or whatever it is, how many of you would want to imitate their faith and be exactly like them and to become a thief and stealer too? I hope none of you would because that we know is something that is displeasing to God. If a leader falls, they lose respect and credibility. That's why the author of Hebrews understands the urgency and the difficulty of life. And he says, keep on praying for us because we need your prayers. Because life is hard. Life is hard for you. Life is hard for us. We are not perfect, so you need to pray for us as leaders. You need to pray for me as a leader. You need to pray for your teachers, for your counselors, all of them. Let me ask you a question. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but just think about it. Think about it. Did you pray for your leaders this week? Did you pray for them? Did you pray for your Sunday school teacher this morning? Did you pray for whoever you thought was going to be preaching this morning? Did you pray for the Sunday school teachers in the other classroom, the Mandarin congregation, the Cantonese congregation, have you ever prayed for any of those that are in the nursery that as they're caring for these babies, they're still caring for souls here. They're singing songs to them. They're trying to teach them things of God. Did you pray for them this week? Did you pray for your counselor as you were coming to church on a Friday knowing that they had a hard week working for you or working and they're coming to serve you? Did you pray for them? Did you think about them? Did you pray for service and for church at all this morning or yesterday or at all this week? These are questions that strike right at our hearts because I would guess maybe some of you do pray for your leaders, do pray for the church, but I would guess some of you don't. And you don't think about your leaders. You don't think about your counselors. You don't think about your teachers. You don't think about your parents. You don't think about your school teachers. You don't think about other people in all contexts. And my question for you is, do you pray for these people in your lives? And maybe the question to follow up, if you don't, is why not? Why not? You see the command, the imperative in 
the book of Hebrews, as the author is painting this picture, he's saying, life is difficult. You need to pray. Pray for your leaders to stand above approach. Pray for your leaders that they would continue to be able to lead you with good conscience, honorably, appropriately, commendably, and excellently. We need your prayers. The church needs your prayers. The world needs your prayers. So let me widen the application a little bit and ask some hard questions towards you. Some of them we've already talked about. Some of them are a little bit newer here. But think about what we've just been looking at in Scripture. And think about these questions. Are there leaders in your life worth imitating their faith? Are there people, men and women of God in your life that are worth following and imitating their faith? Secondly, as you think about the idea of obeying your leaders, are you teachable? Are you someone who is teachable? Are you someone who causes fits for your Sunday school teachers because you're so distracted, because you're asking all these questions that have no business to be asked that are totally off topic? Are you helping the ministry? Or are you hindering it? And when you think about the last point, pray for your leaders. Are you thankful to your leaders? And are you prayerful for them? When was the last time you ever told your leader, thank you for serving me? When was the last time that you ever prayed for them? Think about these questions as you go through the week, as you go through the day. Do you have someone in your life worth imitating your faith? Are you helping the ministry? Are you hindering it in obedience? Are you thankful for your leaders and are you praying for them? And I want to widen it even more and apply even for ourselves, even in our own context. And we've been serving through youth service through this whole year. This is the last youth service at this current church year. And I've mentioned many times before, youth service doesn't just happen out of thin air. But there are leaders who are serving tirelessly behind the scenes, and I want to recognize those youth service officers right now. So if you are a youth service officer and you are here, uh, please stand up. Please stand up. Don't be shy. Please stand up. Okay. Yeah, you can you can applaud. Youth service officers. So. Look around you. These are these are the officers that have served. Just keep standing. Keep standing. Officers of this this past year. These are people who have served you and who have helped you and helped to make sure that we could worship you here. And they have worked hard. I've worked with them week after week, month after month to 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 be here so that we can worship and have a service. Look around. Remember their faces and thank them. And pray for them because they need your prayers and they need some encouragement too. Now, if you've served in youth service in any way, whether AV, whether ushers, whether um, media bulletin, whether moderating or worship, I want you to stand up too. If you've served in youth service, and this includes students and even, uh, we have a lot of adult help too. If you've served, if you've helped in any way, then please stand up. Okay, don't be shy. Look around this room. These are leaders also. And these are people who have served you month after month after month. Remember them. Obey them. And pray for them. And in doing so, you honor Christ who is head of the church. As you thank and remember and obey and pray for these leaders amongst you, you know what you're doing? You're honoring and obeying and remembering and praying for Christ to work and for Christ to be magnified. And that's our responsibility as Christians. Towards our leaders, we are to remember them. We are to obey and to submit to them. And we are to pray for them. Let's pray. You guys could have a seat. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship you this morning. And Lord, we thank you 
for the leaders and the faithful men and women of God that you have placed in our lives to instruct us, to guide us, to help us, to speak to us, to rebuke us, to warn us, to love us, pray for us. Lord, we thank you for their influence and for their impact. And Lord, we pray that we would remember those who have passed on. Lord, that we would remember their faith and that we would seek to imitate them. And Lord, that in the current state and in our current season, Lord, help us to obey and to submit to these rules. And not just to obey and to submit to them, Lord, help us to pray for them, that they would stand strong, that they would be able to remain firm in you, so that together, Lord, we could worship you in the highest sense and without distraction, and we could be blameless before you in that way. So, Lord, we thank you for being our great leader, for giving us Jesus Christ, who is our perfect example, who is worthy of all of our praise. Lord, may our lives be more and more sanctified. May we become more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be more like him. And help us now as we continue to worship you. We thank you, Lord, and pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.